so first of all, thank you once again for having me come in. It's an honor to be back. It's exciting to come back to Connecticut. I left here six long months ago, and ever since then, it's been hard to remember. I did my work at University of Connecticut with Dr. Don Liu and the New Lit Research Lab. I was at University of New Haven for four years, and then they decided that they no longer wanted an education department, I guess. So now I'm at the College of Charleston, working in teacher ed, working in literacy and language development, but also new literacies and technology. So it's an honor to come back up and talk about this. This is a lot of fun for me. One of the things that we will do is, the way that this session will work is that we have multiple moving pieces. And so it'll be a challenge for us to look at these moving pieces all at the same time. Your job as the participants is basically, if there's something that you don't understand, please stop us. More questions and dialogue between ourselves is better than me yammering on. Also, there will be multiple pieces, and we're trying out new technologies all the time. So I have materials that are online. It's already in the discussion group and the discussion thread. We're also playing with new technologies, the BlueJeans device over here. So we have multiple things happening all at the same time. So there will be a hopefully good mix of the theory and the ideas and pushing your buttons, and I want you to ask bigger questions and think about what it means for you, your content area, your discipline, your practice. But at the same time, I'm going to show you behind the scenes what I'm doing to try to make this work. So I will be flipping back and forth on the computer screen. I will show you what I'm doing and how I'm setting things up along with the materials. And that's by design. I want you to see what I'm doing and try and understand how I'm operating things. At the same time, we're playing with BlueJeans. BlueJeans is brand new. I think this is the pilot run, the test drive. All right. So this will be fun. Basically, the idea is that we have people that are video conferencing in. So we're learning about hybrid and blended learning while we're basically doing it at the same time. Okay. And this is an experimental stage. So it should be a lot of fun. I shared out online through Twitter and other places this blog post. This blog post has all of the materials for today's session. It will get us up and running. It's also in the online discussion forum and available on BlueJeans in the discussion thread. But these materials are online. They will be online from now until basically I stop paying my hosting. So that stuff is on there. And it will have all of the materials. And I want to make it openly accessible for people after I've gone back down to Charleston. I want these materials to be out there so that at a later date you can come back and say, I don't quite understand what he was saying about this area. You can go right back in, go to the PowerPoint. We'll have the video copies. We'll have the archives. You can scrub into the video to figure out what I was trying to say, the points I was trying to make. But then at the same time, you can reach back out to me at a later date and get in touch, get in contact with me, and I can walk you through things. So these materials are up online. You see a post with the threads and the loom. And then down below I have all of the PowerPoints and links there. So that is openly available online. That's on my blog. I have three PowerPoint decks. I use Google Presenter. I use a lot of Google Apps. I don't use Office for anything. The only thing I really use Office for is my university forces me to use Outlook for some reason. And then I also use Microsoft Word when I have to edit publications and send them back to editors. And it's funny because I'll write in Google Docs with colleagues, and then I'll download it into Word, fine tune it, and then email the Word doc to the editors. And then the editors take my Word doc and then put it into Google Docs so that they can go edit themselves. So that's pretty much the only thing I use Office for. So this is Google Presentation. The thing I like about it is that I can do my PowerPoint decks online, and I can share them with students. So what I'll do is I'll start up a PowerPoint deck before class, send it out in the online discussion forum or on Google Plus or Twitter, and I can see where my students are. So I can see one person is viewing this PowerPoint deck right now. Because I don't have people signed in, Anonymous Monkey, are you here? Anonymous Monkey is viewing this right now. You can see the individual people that are viewing it. Because I didn't explicitly invite people and it's open, anyone can be reviewing it. 
so my PowerPoint deck is online. When people go back and they want to uh, view it, it's there. If they want to search for it, it's available online. But then also the thing that I love about PowerPoint, about Presenter, is two things. One, we've all been in the business where we go to a conference and we start a PowerPoint deck and then you email it to your colleague to, to add their slides and they add a couple of videos and their stuff and then they email it back to you. And then you're trying to figure out, okay, what version are we on? Or then the links, oh, well, the links were on your computer. They're not on my computer anymore. Or the videos don't load. Everything's online so we can all collaborate. And then you can just share that. You can download it as a PowerPoint deck. Um, the other thing I love about Presenter and sharing this stuff online is that I'll share my materials online, send it out. So this morning I sent out these slides and that blog post openly online. And it goes global. So my followers can go take a look at what I'm sharing. So in the past I've sent my, my slide deck out online and I had a colleague from Germany basically send me a tweet in the middle of the talk. Hey, looks good. Looks like a great session. Have fun. By the way, you got a spelling error on slide 10. So, so quickly while everyone, I said, all right, let's do a turn and talk right now. Talk to your neighbor, go fix the spelling error. Uh, but it's interesting because I sent it out this morning and had a lot of people saying, hey, it looks interesting. Um, I'm excited. I'm going to sit down over my cup of coffee and take a look at this and see what you're, you're talking about today. So we had the slides are up online. We had the video. The only other piece that I have here is I have a Google Doc set up. The Google Doc is here. The Google Doc also has all of the links for all of the stuff we'll talk about today. The Google Doc is openly editable by you. So you can click on it. You can respond there. Let's see who's in there now. Uh, Anonymous Turtle is there now. Uh, so basically all of the PowerPoints, all are linked there. I also have uh, discussion prompts built in. So I have a lot of prompts built into the Google Doc, things to keep us focused, uh, big questions that I have big questions that I hope you will have. All of that is built into the Google Doc. So during our day, you can add comments, respond. What we'll do is we'll try to, uh, some of them we will directly address during our time. If you have a point that you'd like to talk about that's not being addressed, stop me. And we will dig in and go through it and figure out, okay, how do we feel about this? So I have prompts built in here. People can edit. Uh, if you're in the Google Doc right now, Anonymous Turtle is there and <laughs> Anonymous Panda. Can you, all right, Anonymous Panda, you're right there. Can somebody just type in and leave a comment so I can make sure I have it set up the right way? So the nice thing is that people can go in, they can edit, they can leave commentary. Um, part of the reason I want to have this is I want these materials to be openly available so that when I leave, uh, please don't, I, I'm a former, you know, middle school teacher, high school teacher. I don't think that when we leave today, our learning is done. And I know from doing this a lot that there will be some things that we still have larger questions. Part of today might just be the processing side, and you need time to reflect and decompress. At a later date, we'll have follow-up sessions, but by all means, you know how to get in touch with me. I'm online. I'll give you my email, my Twitter account, uh, pictures of my kids, whatever you want. I'm there. I'm open. I'm accessible. If you have a question and you're trying to make this happen, get in touch with me. Um, so Anonymous Panda, I see you slowly working your way down the Google Doc. Go ahead and type something in there. Who else? Anonymous Turtle. All right, nobody, everyone's Google Doc shy right now. So we will get back into this as those of you that have laptops and stuff like that, as we're working through, feel free to add in questions, commentary, um, and we will work along with this. So with that being said, we're going to get started. All right. So today we're going to talk about uh, scaffolding students. We're going to talk about hybrid, blended, online learning. We're going to try and figure out what happens in these spaces. How do we get our kids ready for these spaces? How do we prepare ourselves for these spaces? Um, my hope is that we have many more questions than answers today. Uh, I, I apologize if you're one of those people that think that I'm going to come in and open my mouth and just say things and we will soak it up like sponges. We know from educational psychology that doesn't work. We need to be active learners. Uh, so I want you to think about your own discipline. I want you to think about your own content and figure out what are the holes in what I'm trying to say here? What does this mean for your space and your practice and your classroom and your kids? Um, so we need to have that dialogue. We don't want to just assume that all of this stuff works. Once again, this is the start of the discussion. This discussion is not going to end, okay? 
after i leave, i hope that we continue talking with each other, but then also and and i've been here before talking about this but at a later date, this is stuff that we need to continually figure out people say that i'm ah um a guru or a techno geek or other things when i'm not listening but the the nice thing is that i do this stuff because i build and break things online and i've been doing it for a while i i like testing out new things just like we're playing with blue jeans here i like doing this sort of stuff so my blog is there everything i do is always available there my email address is there my twitter account and then i also do a weekly newsletter what I do is every week I pay attention to what's happening online. I put out a weekly newsletter for, uh, I write it specifically for individuals like the people in this room. I think about educators, I think about people in pre-K up through higher ed, what's happening in literacy and technology. My goal is to uh, put together a, a, a pretty short newsletter once a week that you can read. You're sitting down on a Saturday or Sunday with your iPad out and you just scroll through some of the stuff that's been happening in the week. Um, it's a lot of fun, uh, it's, it resonates with some people, but it's an experiment, as most things that I do are online. Um, one of the things I wanna think about is uh, what I hope that we can achieve today, so I wanna begin with the end in mind. I wanna think about where we hopefully will head today and, and what we can possibly accomplish. Um, so uh, the, the back channel, that's the Google Doc that I already explained before. But basically, we're going to talk about online learning, blended learning, hybrid learning, um, and hopefully we can think about what do you need in order to build in that space. Um, and keep in mind, as you start building in those spaces, you have to build initial product, and then you have to continuously iterate. You have to try something out, maybe even something small, and then put it out there for your students and see if it resonates with them, see if it works, and then iterate. Okay, so it's, a, it's basically an engineering model of teaching. We basically build it, we put it out there, see if it works, reflect, and we iterate. We're being uh, healthy, reflective practitioners. I'm going to suggest that you all uh, start creating digital copies of teaching and learn learning materials, and I'm going to show some of the ways that I do it. I've already been showing some of the ways that I do it. Um, and then if that works, we start to look at the previous materials that we have, and we start to build up those over time. And then I'm going to suggest that you create a digital learning hub a website or a place where you stockpile all of your resources. So the thinking is that your internal content management system, learning management system, what do we use here? Blackboard? Right. Yeah, so I mean, you have Blackboard, that's where your students are. Um, I'm a little bit Blackboard phobic. Uh, I've had a, I, I don't use Blackboard or Oaks at all. I don't use the content management system, but I teach teachers, so I build my own spaces. Um, and that works sometimes and it doesn't work. Some of my students don't like it. Uh, but basically, I want you to build your own space, your own hub where you have your materials. Then when you teach your classes, your materials are archived on your site. When you teach classes, you slide them over to Blackboard, leave the copies there, but you always have your own copy. Because let's say, hypothetically, you go to another institution at some point in your life. <laughs> hypothetically, you might want to have content that you built there, okay? That will be another talk for a larger discussion, a larger panel, a later day. But then we, this is some of the discussions that we need to have. Um, so this is where I would like to head today. Uh, I begin all of my stuff with the tweetable summary. So even when I'm teaching class and I give a brief lecture on social constructivism and led by Gotsky or phonological development with my uh, language and literacy kids, I start off with a tweetable summary. And the thinking is that I want to keep myself focused during this time period. It's basically an essential question. Okay, but it makes me look a little bit slicker because I put tweetable summary in a Twitter logo. Uh, but this is where I want to head during this first chunk. I want to talk about literacy and technology. I want to think about teaching and learning and the fact that we need to constantly re-examine what we're doing. You know, I, I'm doing this a lot in my own practice. I go and I talk to other people about how to do it in their practice, but I'm constantly re-examining it, trying to figure out a better way looking at my student evals when they don't work out well because something I tried and revising that. So I have to constantly re-examine, revisit, and, and redo a lot of the stuff that I do because some stuff doesn't work and it doesn't resonate. Uh, but I'm willing to try things and break things. Uh, yeah, sometimes the student evals get hurt, uh, but I have to have trust on the part of my department head and my dean, um, and then in my tenure reviews, make a three-page case for why I try to do it. <laughs> So I think that we are incredible times right now. I mean, we're all teaching in a period of time where technology is constantly advancing. 
we know what good teaching and learning is, but it seems like good teaching and learning and pedagogy is changing as times advance. Okay? And we really don't know what the future is going to look like. I eat, sleep, breathe this sort of stuff. I, I write a weekly newsletter about literacy and technology. Okay? I do this all the time, and I am not fully sure of what the future is going to look like. Okay, things will always constant. They will always be in change, uh, and we have to try and figure out. Okay, where are we currently, uh, and then where do we want to bring the students to? But that's what teaching and learning is all about. Um, so we have to try and figure out how do we get across these spaces when we don't know what the future is going to look like. Um, one thing that we do know is that our world is increasingly digital. Uh, we know that. Uh, the, the, the space between online and offline, thanks to Edward Snowden, is basically uh, a myth that we tell ourselves. You know, we believe, oh, well, that's the online side. Like, I don't have a website. I don't go on Facebook because I'm not online. And I'm like, well, yeah, you are online, believe it or not. Um, you know, businesses know about you. Target knows about you. Everybody knows about what you're doing and who, you know, what's going on in your world. The world's increasingly digital, okay? Um, and, and our students... We have this expectation that I will be able to take that digital side and bring it into what I'm doing daily, okay? Uh, and our students have that expectation as well. I was They're, shopping at Home Depot last weekend, and it sent me a coupon. It knew I was in the store yeah. and told me to go buy something in the garden center. Yeah, and that's the scary, that's the scary stuff is that it's monitoring what you're doing. You know, my phone, it basically knows, it's not in my pocket right now. My phone knows that I'm coming here. It knows my flight schedule because it scans my emails, you know, and then it says two, three days ago, hey, here's the temperature here in Charleston. Here's the temperature in Hartford. Here's your, we landed and my wife was like, where are we? And I'm like, here's the car rental. Here's the hotel, the map. Just, okay, phone, tell me what to do. Um, one of the things I loved about it was my, my phone is tied into my Google calendar. So I would go have to, I would have to go to student teacher observations. So I'd be in my office and my phone would buzz and it would basically say, without me doing anything other than putting it in my schedule, you need to leave in the next five minutes to get to, to, to the teacher observation because there's traffic on the way, go now. Like, so we have this little, that, that membrane between online and offline doesn't really exist. It exists in our, in our heads. That's a story that we've been telling ourselves for a while to get us through the night. Uh, so our world's increasingly digital for better or worse. There's a lot of challenges there. There's a lot of discussions that we should talk about, but that's another day. Um, as part of that, we have questions about our identity, our digital identity and our face-to-face -face identity. We have questions about uh, privacy and security. Um, you know, as uh, I had a blog post about it recently, but we every year around the same time, around October, November, we see those blog posts about how as educators, as scholars, we should have more of an online presence and we should speak out online about things. And then all of a sudden, we it's funny because uh, you know you work with colleagues and there's some of us that are like, no way, that's not my job. I'm not going on Twitter, no way, no how. I'm not blogging, you can't make me. And some of us are like, yes, we should step out of that, that tower. We should say things online. So we have our own discussions about what does it mean to have an identity? Um, and that doesn't really have a place on our CV or in that tenure packet. So these are some of the challenges that we have. Um, and these are discussions that we need to have. Um, we need to think about our learners. You know, I mean, this is a, a slide that I used the last time we was here. Are these our kids that we currently have? Are these our learners right now? Um, for the most part, they're not. You know, maybe they look like this. You know, I mean, is this what our, our kids look like? Is this what they're doing, um, you know, are these students actively engaged? Um, you know, I mean, email. huh? With their email. Yeah, I mean, this is the this is one of the challenges in my own department. In my in my last two departments, I would go to a department meeting and say, okay, how do we feel about kids having computers in class and, and having them out? And it's like all of a sudden, like the fist fight erupts. You know, it's like taking off the jewelry. All right, no, we're not going to talk about computers anymore in class. But we have our own insights. Are, are these kids engaged? Are they learning? Or are they off on Christian Farmer Mingle or wherever else they might be? You know, what are they doing right now? We don't know. Is this our learner? Is this our kids right now? Okay. So this is, you know, if we're in an online class, but then also we're going to see that the, the online hybrid blended face-to-face 
is a blurry line that we have to figure out, okay, where, where is it end and where does it begin? But is this our kids? Is this where they currently are? Uh, and if so, how do we develop materials for this? How do we develop materials to move across these spaces? Um, and part of the challenging, challenging piece is that, you know, we are not there to direct them across the materials and tell them where to go, what to do, what not to do, what to ignore, what to pay attention to. Um, and the truth of the matter is we don't know what the future looks like. We don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, you know, constant, the, these, back when I was teaching middle school, we were worried that kids would have like a little razor flip phone and they're doing like T9 texting. You know, you had the one through nine buttons and they're banging out, you know, messages to each other. Um, and now wearable technologies are, are huge. How many people here are wearing a wearable device? Apple Watch, a Fitbit, you know, wearables are big, yeah. you know, and, and they are constantly broadcasting it. All of our kids have cell phones, they have mobile phones, they have tablets, they got all sorts of devices. Um, we, you know, we see a lot of augmented reality, virtual realities coming in the classroom, Google, Google Cardboard's coming out. Um, there's a lot of cool virtual devices, augmented devices, mobile devices, wearables, tablets. The thing on the far right is um, Google's playing around with contact lenses with sensors built into them. So it'll measure like your, your glucose levels in your blood and, and you know, give information about that. So this is all happening. Uh, you know, my, my father does work with uh, health information technologies um, and you know, they're excited for wearables that will measure like oxygen levels and your heart rate and everything else and pump that right up to the doctor to let them know what you're doing or not doing. Um, so one of my first questions that I have up on the uh, Google Doc there is, is how do we prepare ourselves for that? How do we prepare our kids? So what are you currently doing? How do you prepare yourself for this? Any initial thoughts? Now we have the Google Doc there. You can leave comments to leave stuff in. We have people online. We have discussion threads. So if you don't want to ask now, that's fine. We'll continuously come back to it. Yeah. Well, I think there's three levels of preparation. One is you, do, you use what you use and you forget about the rest. Okay. It's, the, it's the comfort zone. Yep. Second is when you push the comfort zone to incorporate technologies that fit your organic workflows you're already comfortable with. Yeah. And third is you, mm -hmm. where you boldly explore and go where no teacher had done Or before. should ever go. But frankly, the, frankly, the prospect of doing that, just thinking about it, makes me exhausted. Yeah. Okay? I have people, they're like, do you sleep? Like, you know, they, they had, my students ask me, they're like, do you sleep? And I'm like, yeah, I sleep at some point. Not really with a 10 month old, but. I know. So where are you in that scale? Where am I in that scale? Uh, it depends on how much energy I have on a giving day. Mm -hmm. If I have energy and time, I will push to number two. Mm -hmm. But when I have three committee meetings, uh, some stuff to grade, yeah. and I have to publish, and I'm behind, yeah. uh, I go with what I know yeah. and will take approximately uh, five minutes to reacquaint myself with and master. Yeah. That's for the simple reason that um, you have to bifurcate this into research rich and research poor institutions. Mm -hmm. You're currently talking to a, research, a resource poor institution. Mm -hmm. In resource rich institutions, you have far more support staff, far more technology, far more uh, ability to make this stuff easy, accessible, and congruent with what you're already doing. Here, it's pulling teeth, and they keep on cutting the number of support staff we have for Blackboard, which is not a very intuitive program, which I look forward to with the same enthusiasm as an ice water enema. <laughs> Nice ending there. Well said. Um, and that's the thing is that we, we do have that sliding scale, um, and we have to figure out what resonates for us, what works for us. Because there's a million tools out there. It's a whole ocean. It matters where you want to dip your bucket. You know, there's so many tools, and there's new tools all the time, and it is exhausting. Other comments? I, I was going to say, I, I think that a lot of us have been primed, you know, for this liberal education program that we're hoping that we're going to teach our students critical thinking, we're going to teach our students the, the, the skills that they need for this, whatever evolves. 
So I think a lot of us have invested into that model. And I'm not sure it's going to work. Yeah. I, don't quote me on that. I'm just going to say that I think that that's how we are preparing our students, is we're trying to think more liberally about the types of skills that it will need to evolve. Yeah, and it's, Regardless of wherever it goes. Well, that's it. I mean, before the session even started, I was talking to Phil, and uh, we said that, you know, sometimes when we do this, this stuff exists in our own heads. Mm -hmm. In our mind, we have this model, we have this program, we have this system set up that, that we believe will work. Um, you know, I built a whole program at UNH that I, I was in my mind at work, you know, and I went through to get it accredited in the state and then in the region. And I would, you know, we're basically telling a story, mapping out this is what it's going to look like. And it's all fantasy land, you know. But then when you sit and build it, then you have to iterate. You have to get that model and work on it. And things will constantly change still. Yeah. This all seems so wasteful. Yep. Because we're reinventing the wheel, yep. and all of us individually are doing something that should be done perhaps collectively mm -hmm. or perhaps up in the sky. I can't you mean see, like have a group that builds the stuff for yeah, you? I, I don't have the time or the interest yeah. to build from scratch. Yeah. But give me something that's already there, yeah. and I'll run with it. Yeah. And I think you, somebody, uh, Robert, used bifurcate. We need to, I mean, some of us are maybe going to be developers, yep. but I think most of us are going to be users. Yep. And I'm not going to waste my time, and I, I mean the word waste, yeah. to develop stuff. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't have the time, and I don't have, this, I don't have the experience, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's the that? most effective use of my time. Yeah, see, I think, I, I don't agree with the part like having somebody else build it, because usually I'm a little anal retentive when it comes to my own stuff. And I know what works in my classroom and with my kids, and you're probably the same way. And I don't trust, I'm gonna send it out to somebody else to have it built or use their stuff, because I know I'm not gonna like it. But no we do it what. with everything else in our life. Mm -hmm. You know, we take things from other places and we use them. If it doesn't work, you find something else. Yeah. I don't need to invent my phone, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we will, that's the end of the story too, is we're gonna come back to there's other materials online that you can use and modify, right. which is what teachers do. I'm also going to try and make the point today that I don't want you to reinvent stuff. I just want you to take stuff that you're currently doing and do it a little bit different. Mm -hmm. That's all. Because I, I think the biggest the biggest key here is is not really access, it's time. Time is the one you know value that we can never get back and we don't have enough of. So it's like, okay, if I can take what I'm doing and just do it a little bit differently, then can I get this done? And and not all of it, like yeah, we look at this guy, oh, look at all look at his fancy PowerPoints and everything. It's, yeah, look at all this stuff, too much. But, okay, what's the first step? Like, how do we, you know, what's that first step that we can have and start building up from there? Yeah? Have you ever encountered uh, an institution where you have, like, uh, source people who know a range of educational instruments online uh, that are useful and that people might want to use? And then say an individual faculty member could come with an idea yeah. and they could help them learn it more quickly. Utilize. Some places are doing that. I know at mine, at CFC, they have a, a group called TLT. It's like a little think tank where it's five or six people. They will help build stuff. They'll give you ideas mm -hmm. and you go to work. But part of it is like the faculty member has to take the initiative and go there. They'll do workshops and stuff. That doesn't exist everywhere. Um, my fear is what we're seeing in, in higher ed, but also in business. Um, I saw a, a press release AT&T had about two weeks ago that said they realized that a lot of their employees need to be technically savvy, digitally literate, you know, have that level of expertise. And a lot of their people don't have it, and they're not going to spend the money to build up that base level within them. So now it's your responsibility to build up your own digital level, you know, the digital savvy. You figure out when to do it, you pay for it, you make this happen, or else we're going to find somebody that already has it. So that's my fear is that in all industries, especially higher ed, we're going to say, okay, your evals are low in technology. The students don't resonate. You need to build this up or else. And it's like, well, where am I going to get this support? And it's like, not our problem. Like, you know, that's, that's my concern. Most university is unique in that you have two bodies. One is the faculty that designs the course, and then that faculty member works with, literally, by him or herself, with a, with a uh, designer of programs like this, 
to design something online that's best for that course and best for your teaching style. So it would be great because faculty like us can go to them and say, this is what the course is, this is what we'd like to do, and yeah. then they use their expertise. They to build go, it. Yeah, they, yeah, which is wonderful. Yeah, there's some places that they'll build it for you, yeah. um, but then I have questions and concerns about when that happens, what happens to intellectual property and ownership of that content? You know, I mean, some institutions, uh, they will say, okay, you will take our, at CFC, I need to take the, the online learning class. I need to take the online learning class before I teach online. I'm like, mm, I probably don't need to take that class. No offense. Um, but I need to take the online learning class, to, and it's basically how do I use Blackboard. And I build a class in Blackboard, and then they own it, and they pour it out. So it's, I, I haven't taken it. You know, since then, I probably won't ever. Um, you are an assistant professor right now. Yeah. And you are spending an inordinate amount of time mm -hmm. becoming a tech guru. Mm -hmm. How has this impacted your ability to produce research, to uh, contribute service to the university, and have you received any dire warnings yet from the dean and or the department chair of the consequences of this semi-obsession. Yeah. Uh, my CV's out there, you can take a look. I publish, I publish openly online and also publish in peer-reviewed journals. Um, I got no issues with my CV and, and the last couple institutions, you know, when I was out in the hiring market, they all liked it. Um, I think what I've heard from people higher than me in my field in literacy, they basically, they think that this is the way to go, but they, their thinking is that the, the warning that I got from colleagues and friends, you know, senior researchers is, I shouldn't have to do both. I shouldn't have to say, I'm going to publish in peer reviewed the, you know, the top of the level journals and publish openly. I should be able to do either and the tenure board should be responsive to that. So, yeah. I'm, I'm confused about your question. Are you asking how are we, what are we currently are we doing? What could we do? Or how are we using technology presently in what we teach? I was saying, like, what are we currently doing? I was. This was generally a, a, a litmus so, test to see, like, what are we doing now? So embedding videos, having yeah. recorded lectures so yeah. the students can then come to the classroom and discuss the topic. That's yeah. what I do. I have Put your videos there. online, the lectures online, come back face-to-face. Video, to face and to then face. in class, we just do case studies sometimes so that, yeah. so that they're involved. So that's what I So do. it's almost like the flipped learning model where you I say, okay. We're like in pressure. We're in the nursing department in the pressure to flip the classroom to have the students be more responsible yeah. for the learning instead of us you know, lecturing, and then, you know, you look around, and I want to say that while students are, may be able to operate, they really aren't using the web the way they should, because sometimes I'll say, did you see this, did you read this, and yep. they're like, no, they didn't see it, they, because they're just, you know, texting, whatever, <laughs> yeah. this, that they really aren't using. And a lot of our kids, they want it to be simpler, they want yeah. it to be the, one of the things that I've recognized is that, you know, yes, I do all this other stuff, but some of my kids don't want it that way. Mm -hmm. Some of the kids come in, and that's not how we do school. Like, I come in, I go, read this, read this, read this. I'm just supposed to, they don't like when I ask yeah. them questions. They want, all right, I'm, you're not doing school the way that it's supposed to be. And you even, know? When it's, even when you have, for instance, one day I had the technology fail, I couldn't bring up my PowerPoint, so I had case studies, and I distributed yeah. them. And we covered the material. After I was done, they were like, are you going to go over the PowerPoint? I'm like, we just did it. We just yeah. discussed the topic. Yeah. They are so used to like uh, PowerPoints, this, that mm -hmm. when you do it a different way and somebody else doesn't do it the way you do it, then yeah. all of a sudden you're not doing it yeah. the way it's supposed to do. So it, it's and that goes back to the student email fees. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, you know, you know, you're, you know, either your PowerPoints are too dense or your PowerPoints are dense enough, so you're like on a tightrope. Yeah, you know, exactly. Or, you know? I think these questions are great, and it's great that we're interactive. I just want to make sure we stay on schedule. Yeah, we'll keep going. Okay. Great points, though. I'm great glad point. that great points. we're giving feedback. Um, so we will talk about face-to-face -face learning. This is when they're coming into your class. We're, we're bringing in the online component. Um, we use different terms interchangeably. We use hybrid blended learning. Uh, blended is used more globally. Hybrid is more here in the U.S. It's the same thing. 
Um, but we talk about blended or hybrid learning. Um, so we have a mixture of face-to-face -face and online. There really is no secret sauce. There's no magic number. I know here it's, uh, you know, we have, okay, this is a web enabled, this is uh, totally online, but there is a, there is a uh, continuum across face-to-face -face and totally online. And those kids that we have online, um, they might be in an online course, but if they have issues and concerns, guess where they're coming? They're coming face-to-face -face back to your office to talk to you about why something's not working. So I wanna look at these shades of gray and figure out where do they uh, exist and how can we modify teaching and learning? This piece down here talks about collaboration, okay? So what we have to unpack today is what are the different elements, what are the different pieces or layers that we have to fold in? We have the time in the classroom, we have independent learning, online stuff, and collaboration. Yeah? May I suggest that you're ruining your presentation with that little window there? You know, we're supposed to be able to read that stuff. But it's like Inception. You see me here and you see me there at the same time. Yeah, it's like <laughs> that's the problem. I can't read what's behind me. Yeah. Can we slide me up to the corner or down to the corner? Somewhere else so we can see what's going on. You in the corner, go away. Well, it's covering up some of your text. Yeah, that's yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. So how are you supposed to learn when you're keeping it from? So one of the, the prompts that I have in the Google Doc is um, questions that we have as we move into hybrid blended spaces. And we're starting to unpack these. So make sure you write them down. We have different areas to collect them. Um, but we want to think about what are the bigger issues, what are the bigger challenges as we have them. Can I move? Do I have to move myself? Or? No, no, no. <laughs> Not a problem. So as I said before, um, there's no magic mixture. They're trying to move me to the corner so that I'm not blocking up the slides. Um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is with moving from face-to-face -to, -face to totally online, we talk about hybrid or blended learning, there's no magic mixture. There's no 50%, 51, you know, 49. There's no magic mixture. It matters what works for you, works for your classroom, works for your students. What's the best mixture? Okay, how can I build in those elements? So it might be watching videos from content, reviewing them later, watching it outside, coming into class, you know, watching them online, having discussion. Yeah. In our department, there's currently discussion going on the mix of hybrid, in a hybrid class, it's on the mix of online versus on ground. Mm. Uh, to my amazement, as chair of the DEC, yep. when you go uh, one class a month and three on online, yeah. there are actually students who complain that they don't have class often enough. Yeah. <laughs> a phenomenon I have never heretofore witnessed. Uh, what is, you know, the, there's a continuum of online blended, ranging from every other class yep. to once a month to a couple times a semester yeah. to uh, weekend seminars to a uh, online, uh, to an on-ground experience, either at the beginning of the semester or the end of the semester that lasts for a week that's supposed to cover the content that cannot be handled on uh, online. Yeah. What is your feel about what is most effective in terms of the mix between the amount of time the students spend in class versus the amount of time they can spend online without sacrificing content? And I realize that a lot of this depends on the topic. Yeah. Uh, some courses require more experiential learning and face-to-face -face interaction with yeah. others. But do you personally have a feel for this? Yeah, I, in the past I've had classes, the program I ran at UNH, they had uh, the classes during the year, not in the summer or the intercession, the during the year classes would be totally online. Um, so you're talking 13 weeks, you know, 14, 15 weeks that they're totally online. Um, we had a lot of video conferencing built in. So our students would regularly do Google Hangouts and, and have talks with the professor. Um, you know, we would have the online component built in, but we still felt there was stuff that was missing. So what we tried to build in was we said, okay, once, a, you know, once every other semester, we would bring them in face to face for a day. And our students said, no, we want more. So they were, they were signed up for an online class, they were paying for an online class, and they said, we want to come back once, you know, one night for three hours every four or five weeks. So 
that was the challenge that we had is the university itself said, this is an online course. Students should not have to take an online, you know, they don't have to come in face to face for an online course. That doesn't make sense. But the students themselves said, we want to come in and meet. We want to meet because even online, there's a disconnect. Can we meet for three hours for a class? And so the instructor said, yeah, of course, we'll come in. But then the challenge ultimately that we had was, let's say you have 13 kids in a class, 20 kids in a class, you're always going to get those one or two that are like, no, I'm taking an online class, I don't want to come in. So that's the challenge. We were basically like, okay, that you know, if you don't want to come in, we will record it, we will broadcast it live, we'll send it out there. But if you do, we will be here on this night for three hours meeting face to face. So I, I think it matters what the class is, what the kids want. But I, I recognize that once you go more than three, four weeks, a lot of students want to come back for that face to face, even if it's brief. And at this point, the video conferencing doesn't cut it. You know, at this point, the Google Hangouts and stuff like that, that I've experimented a lot with, and the Skype calls and everything, it's not cutting it. Um, because they'll sit there and, and just tune out. Um, so that's my advice right now. That's what I try to build in, is bring them back for the face-to-face. -face. We have been, my department has been online for a number of years. Yeah. And one of the things that happens to <coughs> us is that our students are in Oklahoma or yeah. Anchorage, Alaska, or so that that has had a, an impact on yep. our bringing people and putting a residency requirement. We aren't doing that because people are everywhere. And that goes back to this point from before is yeah. that um, because budgets, we were talking about this before, because budgets are tight, yeah. our institutions are looking everywhere, everywhere. for kids. Yeah. And so we're looking everywhere, we're looking globally, yeah. And we are saying, okay, we will have this year, two-year program, and we're going to get you from everywhere on the planet. We're going to pull you in virtually because we know we can do that. But then we're also saying you need to come in for a two-week boot camp during the summer. Yeah. You're going to come in face-to-face. -face. The challenge is what do you accomplish in that two-week boot camp? Mm -hmm. So these are all questions. These are questions that I cannot answer. You need to think about your content area, think about your subject, think about good teaching and learning, not ignore good teaching and learning. Uh, so in terms of what models we have, there are six basic models. This is uh, the Christensen Institute. It's just a, a way to evidence the sliding scale of what's out there. Um, these are all on the PowerPoint. I don't want you to look at the specific names and the titles, but think about what options do we have out there. This is the, the Christensen Institute basically looked at all of online learning and blended learning and said, here's basically what people are doing. Um, so they had six basic models that they noticed. Um, and so they had the face-to-face -face driver, primarily online learning, and then on a case-by-case -case basis, the instructor adds in supplements to it. Uh, we also have a rotation, so you have some areas where we'll move between face-to-face -face classroom instruction, traditional instruction, rotate into like a self-paced online part. So we'll say, okay, we're meeting face-to-face, -face, but during this period of time, you rotate in to this online, you know, uh, basically grassy field where you go and you play and you learn on your own and then you come back at a later date. Uh, we have a flex model. Uh, so this is tutoring small groups so you can have a face-to-face -face piece and then have, okay, your team, your working group is going to go online and work together and collaborate and come back to the face-to-face -face part. Uh, online labs, we know all about this. Um, you know, primarily brick and mortar institutions. We have one adult, so the kids will go into an online lab to build up a skill set, uh, learn, you know, work with each other, get a little bit of assessment, and come back into class. Um, and not uh, last but not least, then we talk about uh, self blended learning. So this is uh, massive open online classes or MOOCs. Anybody here take MOOCs or? Yes. developed MOOC, to, you know. So I, I run a couple different massive open online classes online. No, I don't get a, any uh, support or recognition for that. Uh, but basically, this is self-blended learning. This, to me, sadly, is the future. This is where we're headed. Because businesses, institutions are saying, okay, you need this skill set, you don't have it, and we, you need to pick it up or else we will find somebody else that will pick up this skill set and pick up this expertise. This is happening in the at t model. It's happening in business. Um, my friend works uh, up at Mass Mutual uh, in the hiring, firing, HR department, and they have a lot of people that don't have this digital savvy. And so 
you go find your own expertise, you learn on your own and bring it back to your practice. Um, so I think this is where we are headed. You see lynda.com, a lot of these online courses where people can go in and build up the skill set. This, I think, is where we're headed, for better or worse. Um, but this is what, you know, students are choosing the option to go in, students are deciding what to learn and when to learn it. Um, there's a lot of power, but do we have motivated students? That's one of the components. And then we have the, the totally online driver, which is online platforms, teachers can check in as they go. Uh, some institutions are doing this right now, uh, where the, the, the instructor will create the content, put it online, we'll have TAs that will come in and run the different lecture halls and stuff like that. And what we're noticing is a lot of institutions, uh, there was a famous case a year and a half ago at Stanford, where the instructor created the content, put it out there, a lot of, uh, was frustrated with the lack of real teaching and learning happening, you know, and the lack of real assessment. Um, and so the, 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 the professor said, I'm pulling myself out of this model, and the university and whatever, I don't think it was Udacity running, but whatever uh, online course management software is running it, they said, that's fine, you already made the content, we got the content, we can pay TAs to come in and run the class, like the class is there, we'll just run it now, we have your content. So we see a lot of schools and a lot of institutions are really interested in this. Um, you know, higher ed, we're trying to figure out what to do with MOOCs and what to do with this model. We don't know yet. Some places are using it. Uh, Harvard, MIT are using it as part of the application process. You know, take our MOOC on business learning, you know, and that's, if you pass it, that goes into your application. So then we, we put you at a higher level, you know, as opposed to the other, you know, uh, applicants. But this is what we're trying to figure out to do. Yeah. Harvard has taken a step further. Yep. They say that MOOCs are actually an inter intermediary uh, step between an undergraduate and a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christensen in particular yep. is, is saying that the idea of ancillary services and certificates are a legitimate segment yeah. in of themselves. And certainly we've seen the tech field migrate in that direction yeah. where individual certificates you can collect like merit badges yep. in lieu of a master's degree. Yeah. Now earlier you used the word unfortunate. Yeah. Do you think that it is unfortunate, or do you think uh, across the board, or do you think that this is simply the evolution of academic strategy? I think there's there. I do a lot of work and research in digital badges and alternate certifications and stuff like that, and alternate credentials. I think that we are moving to a field where there are some opportunities for uh, micro credentials, so like little steps up. Um, so I, I think we're we're headed into an interesting future where there's a lot of non-traditional learning that can happen. But the challenge is how do you evidence that? So earlier you evidenced my CV. You know how do you how do I reference some online learning or other learning that I do? You know that really helps me in my career. But I don't have a way to prove that I did it. You know, I mean, if you're trying to build up a digital skill set and you get involved in a MOOC and you do what most of us do, which is lurk, you pay attention and you watch, but you don't do anything, there's a huge lurking piece there. But then some of us will follow through and then most of us fail MOOCs, you know? So we either lurk or we fail. Well, I believe you're learning. But how do you evidence that? How do you... So that's what we're trying to figure out is how do we create those micro credentials to say, okay, here's a small step up. Here's how you evidence that step up. And then the bigger challenge is when you get that digital badge, you go into your dean and say, well, I, last year on my TMP report, I said that I needed to improve online assessments. So here's my digital badge that I took from this MOOC. And your dean is going to be like, what, what is this? Like, why are you showing me this? This has no validity here. That's the sort of discussion that we need to have, um, and that might change. You know, I mean, that's so. That's also the tenure P, you know, the T and P committees. Are they having that discussion? Are the deans? Where does that future head specifically for us? But then, with the online learning, self blended stuff, are they constantly building stuff up? You know, so I, I think that there is a future. I think there's an opportunity. I think there's a really good business opportunity there. You know, but that's as much as I'll say about that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk about modifying instruction. I want to think about moving from that face-to-face -face online 
when most of us talk about blended learning, this is what we're thinking about, okay? And most of us, we look at it, we just get an immediate headache. You know, it's like, oh my God, I have all this stuff to do. It's much easier when the kids show up Monday at one o'clock, they leave at 4.30, I don't have to see you. If I get a phone call, yeah, I'll answer, I've got office hours. But then we start to mess with all of this other stuff. You know, so we have synchronous, asynchronous, which we'll talk about today. Then you got the kids that do pay attention in class, but they don't pay attention in class. When you put your, your lectures online, you know, then the kids, you get the kids that complain that, oh, you're just replicating, you're duplicating what you said in class. It's like, well, no, if you paid attention in class, then you would realize that I'm not duplicating. So that's the challenge. When we're dealing with face-to-face, -face, online, synchronous, asynchronous, how do we ensure that kids are paying attention and what are they getting out of those different areas? So one of the prompts I had built in was talking about how do we currently use hybrid blending, but please be sure to put these in your uh, in the Google Doc or on notes or in the online thread. Yeah. I think that last slide with the blended learning raises a question that's being discussed in terms of what are the expectations in our availability? Are we now expected to be available to our students 24-7? Yeah. And other issues that that brings up. I, I went to a, a doctor's appointment and uh, my doctor's checking me out and, and, I, and I'm like, you know what, my family, there's like high blood pressure, cardiac issues. And so we're talking and she's like, I got a question for you. And I'm like, what? She's like, um, so in my practice, we went to like our doctor conference and in my practice, um, they're thinking about using email to have patients get in touch with us. What are your thoughts about having them use email to get in touch? And I'm like, are we having this discussion right now? Is this where we're going? You know, but that's the that's the challenge. And she says, should I let my patients email me? Say, oh, I got this issue, or this is working or not working. How how long should how long should it take me to get back in touch and respond? Um, I think this is one of those questions. This is. Uh, we always talk about office hours. You know, we had this discussion where, okay, I need to have three hours, three office hours for every class or 10 for every class or whatever it says in the handbook. Um, we have office hours, but then what happens when um, I use Google Hangouts for my students? I say, here's my Google Hangouts. We have Google Apps for our school. Here's my Google Hangouts. It buzzes my phone um, and you just send me a text message when you got an issue, okay? If I don't respond, I'm either driving or I'm in class or something like that. I, I, I snoozed my notifications before I even started because all of a sudden you get pings from my kids asking questions. If you're really stuck, you can video conference me if you're free. I realized full well that most of you look at that and go, there's no way in hell I'm doing that. You know, I'm not having kids text me or video conference at their leisure. This is one of those things, you know? Do I still need to have office hours face to face if I'm doing that? Do I have to have both? Right now, I have to have both. But how how quickly should I get back in touch with my kids? If it's an email, our handbook there's an unwritten rule that you have to get back in touch with the kids within 24 hours. If it's an email concern, what about a text message or a, something like that? You know. What about weekends? I mean, yeah. there's contractual issues as well. I, there's a lot of my colleagues that. I don't answer, I have my work email, I got my own personal email. I don't, when I leave on the weekend, I'm not looking at my email. That I don't care, I'll come back, I'll get to it when I come back Monday, I'll be, I'll deal with it then. That's, you know, a case by case, department by department piece. But these are discussions that we need to have. What is the expectation so that I am responsive to my students, but also I'm not irresponsible to myself. In my syllabus, I literally, tell them that I'm available Monday through Friday, nine to five, not on the weekends. However, normally I'm on till 10, and I will answer them until 10 p.m., but on weekends, I don't, I don't communicate with them. Yeah. But it's written right in the syllabus. And that's one of those things that you need to be explicit, yeah. just the same way we do with our attendance policy, just the same way with absences and not turning and stuff. It's gotta be, here's when and how I'll get in touch with you. Because if you're, the questions from before about the op totally online class and the hybrid learning class, you know, you have students that are online, if they don't, if you don't immediately respond, they feel like they're getting ignored. And it's like, no, I'm not gonna immediately jump and, and jump to your beck and call when you ask a question. So as you build these materials and as you build the online pieces, how do you set it up so that you're not overburdening yourself, but you're being responsive to the students? 
because the students, once again, that student eval piece. If they're having a totally online class and they send you an email or a message and you don't get back to them the next morning at 10, they might be like, oh, they're not, they're not responsive to my needs. They're not, they're not there to support me. Because online, sometimes time takes on a life of its own. Um, so one of the last questions I had for the first part, and this would be an interesting turn from the, the questions we've had so far. What do we lose when we move to the online from that face-to-face -face interaction? So, you know, if we're face-to-face -face every day and you're staring in that kid's eyes and you know when they're, uh, you know, and you know when they're on board, like, we know that our institutions, we know that society, and I just made this beautiful case somewhat about how we need to push to the future, but what do we lose? What do we lose when we're moving to online and hybrid and we're moving away from that face-to-face -face interaction? What are we losing? Yeah, what do you think? I was saying the skill, the skill development of interpersonal skills mm -hmm. and team-based skills yep. are really very difficult to do online. If not, I won't say impossible, I'll just say very difficult. And I think that's part of what we look at, again, I'm talking about our liberal education program, we talk about embedded interpersonal skills where yep. we're expected to teach these as part of our other um, first obligations that if we don't have an on on ground presence, yep. it's very hard to have those happen. Yeah, and part of this is we want our kids to work face to face, but then the other challenge is we have to think about what's what are the future of jobs and what will their future in the job look like. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to this distributed workforce mm -hmm. where they could be anywhere globally and do their job. Mm -hmm. You know, and I earlier I. I was listening to a podcast and they talk about artificial intelligence and we think that robots are going to come take away the jobs of the unskilled masses. But then there's a, a book that just came out where they were talking about, no, it's, you see most of the disruption in the, you know, the higher tier professions. You know, you look at like legal Zoom, you know, and it's, it's recreating law. You look at, there's medical pieces where they'll, you can dial in and get a free diagnosis and checkups and stuff like that. There's a lot of disruption in education, you know, so that's one of the challenges that we have is, you know, what is the future of jobs? You know, how do we make sure that they still have those interpersonal, intrapersonal connections, mm -hmm. but then they're still learning? Yeah. I think it depends on the kind of online um, space you use. I, when I was doing my doctorate, we had online, but it was uh, synchronized. So yeah. we, we did interact with people from around the country, but uh, we were put in classrooms, we had to discuss, yep. come back to the classroom, so it can be done without... What program are you in? Uh, I'm at Oakland University. Yep. I've had students that have taken classes with Phoenix and stuff, and they, like, I'll have my online classes, and then they come in, and they'll say, these aren't really online. You know, Phoenix, like, you're logged in, and you, you show up 7 to 8 o'clock or longer. You know, you're in together, you're all there face-to-face. Um, I've also had students, you know, paralleling the other questions. I've had students complain about that. They say, I'm taking an online class. I should be able to show up whenever I want. You want me to check in throughout the week and show progress over the week? I'm not gonna. This is online. I should be able to show up whenever I want. So we would, we had a, I had a faculty member in my program that he would say, okay, yes, this is an online class. It's 13 weeks long. Uh, every Saturday from noon to three, you need to be in front of your webcam. And we're gonna have discussions. And they're like, but then it's not an online class. And my answer as, as the head of the program was, you need, for this program, you have to rip up your idea of what an online class is. You come in with this, these preconceptions about what online class means, that's not what it means here. So if you don't like it, you know, there's other programs for you. I mean, but, it's a very hybrid program where we had on ground, we had online, we did meet for weeks and weeks, and then we met yep. for whole weekends. We were in Washington for one of the courses for mm -hmm. like a week. So it was like very geared towards people who were working, um, but still wanted that, you know, 25, 75% where I don't have to be somewhere at the same time, but once in a while we touch base. And see, those programs excite me because it becomes a part of your life. Right. And, you know, for some of us, we don't want it to be part of our life, but you know, then learning, then you have the opportunity to say, okay, learning is everywhere. You know, now it's with you all the time. Learning is ubiquitous. 
you know now it's it's really experiential education. i can walk around and see things happening and i'm interacting. i see some face to face but then i'm also online communicating. so there's a real opportunity to expand teaching and learning outside of that classroom and outside of time. yeah i've always wondered something that bothers me is how can you really know who is doing the work? yeah in an in a synchronous that's okay but if it's asynchronous you really don't know yeah and i'm always worried about that i agree uh, because i think that uh the end result is you have students who show up you know but at the end <laughs> when you try to evaluate them they really haven't learned anything yeah so how do you deal with that yeah i <laughs> last week i gave my kids a um it's a language and literacy development class. And I said, okay, we're gonna have a quiz on the first four chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. And in my class, I know that we've gone backwards and forwards. I've assessed them multiple times in class. I've assessed them multiple times online. Mm -hmm. So to me, the quiz was just one other fact check, you know, but I had, I sent 10 items in an online quiz using Google Forms out. They add their name, the computer automatically grabs their, um, their uh, IP address and their login. So I know that their, their login is them, but I don't know if it's, they sat down and hey, log in and then somebody else takes it. For me, what I do is I have multiple assessment points. Um, what I also do is I have, um, if I have collaborative work, I have a lot of collaborative work in my classes, a lot of collaborative assignments. What I do is I have students work collaboratively and plan this uh, next week. They had the start of presentations. They'll collaborate on a lesson plan and teach it in class. So I had them collaborating along the way. And then after they collaborate along the way, I say, okay, I want you to each individually email me a reflection on what worked and didn't work in the group. And I said, what happens is you all throw each other under the bus for not showing up, not doing the work. And that's the way that I can build it. My advice would be multiple assessment points, you know, have a variety of assessments, a variety of ways that you try to, you know, better understand what kids are doing. Um, but I agree, There's, there still will be that question, what is this kid actually doing? Are they interacting with the content? Yeah. Sometimes in person, yeah. there are times when the class sort of has a psychic interpersonal connection. Yeah. We're really communicating mm -hmm. on a very profound level. Um, All right, I'll, I'll, I'll just find it. Basically, some of the people in the fancy neighborhood in Atlanta. Yeah. This happened in my neighborhood. This video. I was already. That was me metacognitively already answering. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, I've had that too. Yeah. Where the class develops this this vibe yeah. and it sort of carries you along, and you have a transcendent learning experience, yep. which Mezrao says is the ultimate goal of education. Yep. Um, and I've never had that online. Yeah. Have you ever had that online? Yes. Um, yes, I have had that experience online. I would also add to your question, sometimes there's that transcendental learning experience where everything is great. Sometimes there's that experience where everything goes poorly. You know, like we have like that, that class from hell where everything goes wrong, you know? So that I think there's both sides of the coin. And the nice thing is when you're there face to face, you can ride the wave or you can you know derail you can you know or avert that that tragedy that's about to happen online there's a lot of challenges you know online sometimes there's a negative stigma there's a negative vibe sometimes i think with online what will often happen is that there is that transcendent vibe as you said but the transcendent vibe it's we are not connecting with it so we don't feel it or see it um in in one of my programs i had um a lot of online, a lot of Google Hangouts, and then the face-to-face -face stuff. At the end of the whole program, I talked to my students and they said, yeah, we used to sit up, the three of us, we would sit up uh, at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. We'd sit there with a glass of wine and we'd sit there for like two hours and do our homework and just talk and chat and we would debrief each other. And I didn't know any of this was happening until the whole thing was done. They were basically graduating. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? They're like, we didn't thought, like the tool was there, we made that space, we had that opportunity, we started talking, but we didn't think that you really cared about it. I'm like, I, I think that's super cool given what I do, but. And, and what amount of wine do you recommend? <laughs> it 
it matters. Certain, certain wines, certain varieties go better with learning management systems than others. You know, I think a Cabernet, a fine Cabernet goes well with a, a blackboard piece, but um, so moving on. Oh, yeah.